Welcome back, everyone, to the Shepherd Station. We're at the Stockyard in Headland, Alabama, 24 East Church Street. Come by and see us. Great sandwiches, great food, great coffee. Uh, all our coffee is provided by Mural City Coffee. If you can't come see us, go see Zach and Destiny in downtown Dothan at Mural City Coffee. Really, really good people. Great place to hang out. And joining me again today, as always, is Andy Hughes and Thomas Brown. We have a really good show prepared for you today, I believe. And we're going to be talking about what is it that you're going to stand up for? Understanding the world in light of bib- uh, biblical prophecy. And you know, basically the state of the world today. And with that being said, Thomas, could you pray over this episode so we can really, yeah. you know, let the Lord be with us today yeah, and kind sure. of guide us? Yeah. God, I just pray that uh, you give us the words to speak and that uh, as we're navigating this topic, that it'll be something that will really um, benefit somebody else, help them walk through their life, become better men, become better fathers, whatever it is that they need in order to lead their family, lead well in law enforcement or um, in public service in general. Father, just pray that you are over this whole entire situation and conversation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, kind of a touchy subject, and uh, not everybody wants to talk about it. You know, at our church, uh, our pastor is very strong in this belief. Are we in the last days? Uh, so, kind of hitting things as we go maybe little mini categories here. Are we in the last days? And the reason that I'm asking this is because I'm kind of bringing something up after we talk about this. What do you think, Andy? Do you think we're in the last days of existence? Well, I think the uh, the people back in Jesus' time or after Jesus ascended in, back into heaven, I think that they thought they were in the last days also. I think we've always been in the last days to us. To a certain extent, but I think now more than ever, more biblical prophecy has been uh, has has unfolded and has become true than in years past. We're seeing a lot of different things now that are happening that would lead us to believe that we are closer to the end times and in the last of the last days more than ever. Thomas, yeah, I agree with that. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's yeah, we've been. We are in the last days. We've been in the last days since Jesus came. And he's been talking about, you know, he talked about that back then. And so um, I completely agree with that, that, uh, you know, we are in the last of the last days. I think that even more so than just, um, you know, more prophecies happening. I think it's that we, well, I'll say me, because when I was, when other things were happening that were kind of historic, I guess, that the church started looking at and really, you know, I think Kenneth Hagin, I think some of these guys, you know, um, I was younger, I was a teenager. I didn't really understand it. But now that I do understand and see some of this, it's like, I see these things happening. Um, and so for me, it seems like there are these Bible prophecies unfolding and it seems like it's the last of the last days. You know, um, I'm sure our parents and grandparents thought the same thing, you know, um, that there was a moment in their life where they saw Bible prophecy or something that had happened or was going to happen, you know? So um, I think it's just an unveiling. It's something, and it's great. It's something that should remind us of God's return. It's something to remind us that we are in a spiritual battle, that we're not just coasting through life uh, here on earth, but that God is doing something. He has a plan that's being unwound and unraveled as we get to experience it. And so, yeah, I think so. You know, I think... uh kind of when we were talking about what we were going to do on this episode, you know, what our topic was going to be. We talked about, you know, the end times and, and, and having a biblical worldview also. And uh, it, whether it's the end times or not, we always need to have a biblical worldview. And I think a lot of people hear that term, but they don't know exactly what that term really means. But, you know, having a biblical worldview means that you look through, you look at the events of the world, you look at what's going on in our world, and you look at it through a biblical lens. Uh, There are a lot of different worldviews. Some people are going to look at things through an atheist worldview or an agnostic worldview or just a a worldly worldview where they don't apply the Bible to anything whatsoever in their lives as 
as it relates to what's going on in the world. You know, we, we talk about end times, and, and, and people have always been, been evil. Evil has existed uh, since, the, since the dawn of time, since right after you know, God created this earth. And, uh, but, you know, the Bible says in, in the end days that, you know, uh, evil will be called good and good will be called evil. And I don't think that I've ever seen this. I'm, I'm 56 years old. I've never seen the world as it is today as it pertains to that particular statement. There is so much out there that uh, is evil that is being called good or normal today I, and okay. vice versa. Normal. That was a good term to, for you to use because that's yeah. what it's – everybody's normalizing well, things if they, that should not be normal. Well, if, if they make it seem normal, then it doesn't seem evil. It's easier to swallow. Yes, right. That's right. It's easier easier to push on the general public. And if you don't have a biblical worldview, if you don't look at things through a biblical lens or from a biblical standpoint, then you will be more easily swayed to believe that oh, this LGBTQ plus whatever this is normal. Transgender is normal. Mm-hmm. Um, evil in general is is normal. You know. Uh, just, yeah, and I think something that's different about where we are today too, because a lot of people will say. Um, well, the, you know, you look at the Romans even back then, there's that, that whole thing. It's like, how, how many times a day do you think about the Roman empire? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like we think of, if you think about that, it's like they, they normalized, I mean, in their life, it was completely normal to do exactly what's going on today. And there's a lot of correlation there. However, the difference between America and Rome and even other nations is that we started out with a worldview that was not that, that is now being shifted You know, the culture is now shifting into that, where Rome was always that way. And then there was the Jewish state that was a part of that, that that was taken over by that. But um, we live in America, which was founded upon biblical, you know, uh, principles. And so over time, those biblical principles are being kind of, you know, not kind of, but really trashed and thrown out the window, you know, which is a completely different concept than what happened back then. Well, they they try to turn... Right, I say they, we keep using general vague notions here, whatever you want to call them, left, Democrats, cabal, I don't it's care. It's the ideology. I think the that's ideology, a good way to put it. However you the want ideology. to put it. It's, it's, just, it, it's Satan. Satan. Yeah. Okay, the, Incarnate. It, 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 yeah. Has watered down so much stuff for us as Christians that we now look at, well, that's just normal. So we, I mean, that's the way you know a lot of us grew up on certain issues, but it's gotten to the point now that, like Andy said, you got you know the LGBTQ backslash hashtag whatever movement, and you know transgenderism. You know you've got people that are sitting there, you know, approving the mutilation of their children to to change them at you know five, six, seven years old, and they're wanting you to accept that and say, well, no, that's okay. But we we watered down so much that we've gotten into this point where what is good, what is evil, what is wrong, what is right. And the only way to f- get back to that is to get back to what the book says. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to get back to the book. I've been reading this book. Can I'll I give, real I'll, quick? I want to go further than just the LGBTQ and trans because I think we talk about that a lot. Yeah. I think we got to be careful not to just, you know, talk about one issue and not, you know, there's uh, there's a whole lot more going on in our culture than just that. Oh, that's calling the evil good and good evil. Mm-hmm. So don't. Hopefully, we're not saying you, people aren't thinking like, hey. We our sole motive is just to wipe out that movement. No, it's no, not that. No. It's there's sin more. Is sin. It's, yeah, yeah. It's well, sin is sin. So like, sin is sin. And people are reason, sleeping around. I mean, like there's a whole no, lot that the sexual morality world um, is calling uh, uh, evil. There's murder. There's you name it. The sin is yeah. is running rampant. I use that one because that's you know one of the ones that you know everybody's seeing in the media. Right. right? right. And I just wanted to mention. No, absolutely. That, I'm, that, look, yeah. I make no judgment on anyone. I'm going to sit there and say, and that's what this book that I'm about to tell you about kind of stands for, is what are you willing to stand up for? Look, I love, I love mankind. I, I have understood now that as much as I quote, you know, when you become a cop and you've done it for so long, and Andy can affirm this, you get cynical to a lot of things, and you have to fight that cynicism. You have to try not to be that way. So getting cynical with that, a lot of times you, and I've said this in the past, you don't necessarily want to deal with people that much, even though that's what you're doing. Because you you deal with their 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 help me out with the word here uh, their toxic crap <laughs> all the time. I mean, it's the best way I can put it. <laughs> kind of lost where I was going with this, but uh, you know, I don't make any judgment. I, I've understood that you know the reason that we did this is because we do love people. We want to serve people. We want to 
And now I want to serve people in a different way because I want to bring God into their lives. I want to bring Jesus, you know, bring them to Jesus. I can't save you. Jesus can. If I can bring you there, that's my job. That's Mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to do. But we have to stand up and we have to take a stand on what God calls evil. And whether or not you are a homosexual or you're a, a trans, I don't, I don't judge you for that. I, I pray for you because I hope you understand the book that I read, the Bible, says that that's not right. And I have to take a stance against that. I have to take a stance against murder. I have to take a stance against um, uh, theft. I have to take a stance against sexual immorality. You know, I, we all have pasts. But what advice I would give to young men today, stop chasing every woman you see. Look for the one. Look for the one that God gives you. Stay away from the sexual immorality. God sits there and talks about how he hates sexual immorality more than anything in the Bible. So, no, I'm not sitting there saying that we're picking out one thing. But we do have to take a stance against all sin so that we can help further God's kingdom. And this book that I'm reading, and I'm going to go ahead and give a plug for it. I don't know the guy... Uh, the, I was turned on to this book by my wife. Uh, she just bragged about it, bragged about how awesome the book was. It's Understanding the World in Light of Bible, uh, Bible Prophecy by Jonathan Shuttlesworth. And that's the whole thing that he's talking about. There. <clears throat> it starts out with kind of in the COVID era, how you see that pandemic, whatever you want to call it. I have my own thoughts on that as well. And I think you have had conversation. I know, you know, we've all talked about that here. But um, how even, you know, Christians in that moment were being, they were, they were backing down. You know, hey, close your churches. You don't need to go to church. No, we don't need to do that. Why would we ever do that? You know, stand up for what God says is right. But that's the whole premise of the book is what are you willing to stand for? And there's a lot of stuff, information in this book. It's just amazing. Um, kind of one of the things that stood out to me. And I want to read it because I don't want to, I don't want to misquote anything in the book. So the second Bible prophecy regarding the church age, from creation to Abraham was 2,000 years exactly. From Abraham to the birth of the church, exactly 2,000 years. I find it very interesting that about 2033 or 2034 will be the 2,000 year mark for the third age. Because everybody goes, well, the birth of Christ. No, it was actually the birth of the church when Christ was crucified. You know, now we've got 2,000 years exactly. Do you know what happens in 2030? You ever heard of Agenda 2030? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you've right. got Agenda 2030 coming. It is, you know, I, I go back to the question that I asked. How close are we to the end times? How close are we to seeing the coming back of Jesus Christ? How close are we to seeing the sky split and him coming down? Because we're in that point right now. Mm-hmm. We're approaching 2030. The World Health Organization, the WEF, all these, you know, the United Nations, they're pushing for this one world global economy, this global governing body. And we all know if you, if you are a Christian, you know what that means. You're going to usher in the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we're pretty close is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, the, the, the main thing that I think people need to realize, Christians need to realize is that even though we know what the prophecy is, And even though that we know that Jesus Christ and Christians are going to win in the end, we can't just sit back and watch this unfold without resisting it. We can't sit back and watch all of this unfold without uh, being vocal about it. And it's just just like you said, Eric, what are you you willing to stand for? What What are you willing to die for? What are you willing to vocalize? What are you willing to, uh, you know, how far are you uh, willing to go to make a statement of your faith in God? I think that's what the whole, that's what we're talking about today all all together. What will you, what will you stand for? You know, what hill are you willing to die on, man? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Got several. Are you, are you willing to die on any, this is a question straight for you, constitutional officer. Yeah. Are you willing to die on anything that's going to violate the constitution? Are you willing to stand up? Okay, okay, they come in and they say, all right, you know what? No longer can you have free speech. No longer can you sit there and say what you want to say on the street corner. That's a hill worth dying on. Is that a hill worth dying on? It sure is. Absolutely, 100%. absolutely is because they're, they're, at that point, you, you can say, well, okay, well, the Constitution <coughs> is not a biblical document, but the Constitution is based upon 
biblical principles and unalienable rights that are granted by God the Father, not what by government. What did you say that one the one podcast when we talked? You said about the Constitution doesn't make rights, right? Yeah, what, the, the Constitution say? does not give us rights. Okay, the government cannot grant us rights. What the Constitution does is limit the government from infringing upon your rights as citizens of the United States of America. A lot of people don't realize that. There's a lot of lawyers, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, government officials, and a lot of uh, politicians that don't realize that either. Right. But they need to realize it. They need to know what the Constitution actually means. And I'm no, I'm no expert on the Constitution, but you know, coming from a law enforcement background, I have dealt with the Constitution for a number of years, and I've tried to study it. Uh, especially the Bill of Rights. You know? well, we have to because, you know, in, in our line of work, well, I mean, you know what happens if you violate somebody's constitutional rights, mm-hmm. especially if you do it willingly. Right. You're going to prison. Yeah. It's that serious. The Constitution does not give you any right to do anything. It protects the rights that you already have. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so that's what, you know. So we, it goes yeah. back to, you know, Andy's right. The Constitution is not a biblical document. Absolutely not. Um, but it is the supreme law of this land. United States. And it's unlike any other document uh, that exists in any other government in the world either. Right. And I would yeah. safely say that the founding fathers, when they put this place, you know, the, uh, the Constitution into place, they used Scripture and the Bible to guide that document, if that makes sense. Right. So the country was founded on biblical doctrine, and the Constitution was set up to protect those rights given to you by God. Where we go back to the question is, what hill are you willing to die on? And now understand, again, I have to say this so often, I'm not talking about let's rise up and get you know, an armed revolution. I'm not, no, not at all. But at some point, we're going to have to stand firm in our belief. Yeah. My belief is in A, every word that comes out of that Bible, B, the Constitution and what it stands for. So what am I willing to, to stand for all the way up into the loss of my life? Right. There's many things that I'm willing to stand for. Right. You know, that brings me to an interesting, interesting point. This is something that's been on my mind all weekend long. But some of these people are about to drive me absolutely crazy about college football. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, really. You are know, we let, going there? Let, We're going to go there. Let, let me get to this. Careful, you might lose some listeners there. Come <laughs> yeah, on. I don't this care. Fresh. I don't, I don't Pull care. that Band-Aid off. I don't Ugh. care. Listen, you know, I enjoy a competitive athletic sporting event as much as anybody. I love to watch a good football game, a good baseball game, a good MMA match. Absolutely. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be, track and field. I mean, I love – competitive nature and I love people who who devote their lives to perfecting their craft you know in, in athletics but you know I've heard so many people especially this past weekend this college football playoff crap going on and all and they're cheering about their team and they're you know going against the other team and you know people are making these just totally idiotic Facebook posts about their team and I don't care if it's Alabama if it's Auburn if it's FSU uh, you know, Michigan, I don't care who you are, but they're just making totally idiotic Facebook posts about football, you know, what they're for and whose team they're against. But how many of these same people, especially Christian, I'm talking to Christians right now, how many of the people that are making these Facebook posts that are Christians, do you ever see anything on their Facebook page or, or vocally or, or whatever the case may be or in public about them decrying evil? How many of them out there going, I stand for good against evil? Instead of I stand for my team against their team, how many people do you see out there that are saying, you know, I'm against, I'm, I'm for God and I'm against Satan? I'm against child sex trafficking. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how many people do you see out there that are doing this on their on their Facebook page or making these kind of public statements? Are they standing on a hill? Are they they're willing to stand on a hill to to virtually die? for their college football team against somebody else's <laughs> college football team, yeah. but they won't stand up for what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, what's God versus Satan. Come on, people. That's all i got to say about it. <laughs> I, I've had to work and listen to these rants before, people. Trust me, he's, he gets passionate about Man, stuff. that's good. But no, he's, that, you're absolutely correct. You know, you got guys that will sit there. Now, remember something, too, man. You know, Tyson said it. Everybody's, you know, there's too many people getting comfortable with disrespecting people 
you know, yeah. getting punched in the face. On, on like social that, media. You know, on social yeah. media, you know. Yeah. I mean, so people are going to get on social they'll, media. They'll say things say to people they would never say to their face. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because <laughs> like, the there problem. might be some consequences. Exactly. Yeah. Keyboard well, warriors, but they're not going to stand up and say, hey, man, you're wrong and blah, blah, blah. Right. Because they're going to get and knocked in what's the nose. Cra- you know what's really crazy is that the number one fear people have is public speaking. Mm-hmm. But nobody is afraid to post their opinion on Facebook. <laughs> it's insane to me yeah, I because know. I think it, it just shows the disconnect people have from actual people. They don't they don't care on there. They're disconnected. They're numb to what people are thinking, feeling, acting, whatever. Um, they can just put it out there and then just leave it. And if and, they choose to, they can turn off the comments. Yeah, you yeah. know. But if so they've they don't got even a, have to live, listen yeah, to them virtually, it. most yeah. people are afraid to actually have conflict. Period. But before we right. move on with the Bible prophecy thing, I just want to give a disclaimer really quick, and I'm going to read scripture <laughs> because I think <laughs> we've got to put this in here so that everyone knows where we sort of stand on this. Because everything we're talking about, Bible prophecy, is such a slippery slope. Because we can get into, a lot of people have, and again, certain pastors that I think of, you know, like I said, Kenneth Hagin and some of these guys have gotten into um, a slippery slope where they've tried to predict when these things will happen. No, that's not, that is not, (laughs) no, I'm about to, hang on, I'm about to read it. Okay, all right. (laughs) Because what you're talking about about (laughs) is these guys trying to sit there and say what, you know, I don't buy into that. Right. So, so let me just read it really quick. Matthew 24, 36 says, this is Jesus. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Here's who's, here's who does not even know, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. Exactly. So, if to think that we know is to think we know more than the angels and Jesus and that we are ultimately God because only the Father knows. So you must be the Father if you know. No, okay? absolutely. So and no, no, that's, no, 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 no. We don't know no, yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. So. I know that. And that's why I wanted to put that disclaimer out there. It's like, I'm, look, I'm none of us are saying when these things are going to happen. None of us know. Nobody knows. And, and if we think we know, we're probably more wrong than we think we are. Yeah. Right. However, there are signs and there are things that happen that can set that tell us Hey, they were like I said earlier. They remind us we are in biblical times. Like, but the Bible is being is being unfolded all the time. If we just look around, well, we can one see. Thing, it. And I don't mean to interrupt you. One thing that, and maybe it's me getting older. I don't know. Andy said it. We've always been in the end times. You know, yeah. at the birth. I'm sorry, at the birth. At the at the resurrection of Christ, when he when he ascended to heaven, we have been in the end times. Every one of the disciples believed that they were going to see the return of Jesus, correct? Mm-hmm. Everybody, they're all nodding up and down. Yes, yes, yes sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we all have faces for radio. That's not why we're not, that's why we're not on video yet. Uh, but no, they all thought that they were uh, in the end times. We sh- and that's the big thing that has been coming up to me lately. And again, maybe it's because I'm getting older, I'm getting closer to my death, who knows, whatever. Should we not always be feeling like we're in that end Absolutely. times. We should be living that Absolutely. way. We should be professing the name of Christ. We mm-hmm. should be an example to the people that around us to glorify God in everything that we do, say, yeah. act. And I say it this way all the time, is if, if you truly believe we're in the end times, no matter what I believe about the end times, if I believe that I'm in the end times, the way I live should not change depending on how close Jesus is coming. It should be exactly the same now as if you were coming in an hour. I think the only thing that should change is your excitement level might get a little bit yeah, higher. Yeah, <laughs> like, if you, yeah. If I mean, you knew your yeah. excitement level <laughs> My emotions get a would bit change higher. for yeah. sure. So You know, Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And and First John two fifteen through seventeen says, "Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And I think that goes along with what what uh, you two just said there. That we need to be living our lives as if." Today's the last day. Yeah. Tomorrow's the last day. Next week so may, right. may, may be the last day. And these two ver- verses here, I think, uh, you know, they, they, they tell us that, you know, and we do not need to love the world because it's going to pass away. And it, it talks about in, the, in, this, in this verse of Scripture, too, about the lust. But he's not. In this, he's talking about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. 
Uh, lust of the flesh, of course, is going to be sexual immorality and giving into that. Lust of the eyes, but there's a lot of different lusts. We can lust for a new truck. We can lust for a new house. We I was can, about to say. We can lust yeah. for a, a vacation home. We can lust for a better job. The lust of the, the flesh would be. be those things that make you feel good. Yeah. You know, that they're not necessarily, I mean. Instant gratification. Is wanting a new truck necessarily a sin? No. No. But it's when you value that above Right, you lust. Know, well, all, yeah. of, all, all of this, you know, it just reverts back to idolatry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? And, and a lot of the people think, oh, no, nobody here is um, is bowing down to Buddha, okay, or Baal or, or any other uh, so-called god, the ones with the little G, not the big G, <laughs> like I said before, the real god, uh-huh. the one and the only, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. But, you know, idolatry can be things mm-hmm. or wants, they can be a new truck, a new house, a better job. A new gun. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you, you, you Let's quit, ease that you out of you there. Quit, okay. You done quit preaching and went to meddling. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, idolatry can be anything. It doesn't have to, have to be an actual so-called God. It can be a lot of things that we lust for or want on a daily basis. And idolatry is anything that you put before serving Jesus Christ. Right, and we're all guilty of that. Nobody, I don't care who you are, you're guilty of idolatry. Yeah, and we have to. I mean, the only way around that is to repent. Mm-hmm. You got, you got to realize that, <coughs> and that, and that's that's human nature. I mean, all sins human nature, but idolatry is 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 a pretty strong human nature, and lust is very a very strong and, human nature. You no, know, what you're talking about though, we go back to the societal, the societal norm is to pursue those things above mm-hmm. you know hey go to church spend your hour hour and a half in church on sunday maybe go on wednesday you got enough church at that point now go live your life and do what you're supposed to get yourself a good job make sure you have a mortgage make sure you have a nice car make sure your wife has a nice car make sure this make sure that oh you know make a little time for god over here but we have it completely backwards that's not what we're supposed to be doing right you know, but that's that's how the, the world has driven us. And in doing that, they have driven the world, Satan, enemy, whoever you want to refer to it as, has driven us into that thought process that we don't even realize we're idolizing the things that we do. Yeah. And Yeah, they become our desires. That word lust, you know, can also translate desire. Okay, so my son. My son is on, you know, it, it, well, I say this because He's my son. Um, and I'm talking, referring to my seven year old, uh, Paxton. He's on fire for Jesus. He is. He has a stuffed Jesus that he carries around. He's, you know, he wants this six foot Jesus. I mean, he just, everything is, hey, God said to do this. You know, uh, Jesus, you know, loves us. And he will literally tell other kids at school, in elementary school, I never did that. I know for a fact I never did that. <laughs> but he's, he's preaching Jesus Christ to other children in, uh, elementary school right well he, he was so upset because this one kid uh, and i'm not going to use his name but this one kid in his class you know he's telling him about jesus and he tells him about oh, jesus is a brat you know and he's really upset about this kid because this kid doesn't know jesus and i think that's awesome but at the same time i'm like hey buddy you want to sit down and do your you know your your bible devotional and he chooses to play his game hmm. so hmm. You know, we society is as what it is now puts all these things in front of us that seem more entertaining, more mm-hmm. you know, I want to do that instead. Yeah, I know, I know about Jesus, I'm good. Oh uh, yeah. You see yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I see what and you're saying. And we have totally. to work towards Absolutely. you know, keeping him off that path. Yeah. Well, and okay, so that that's a really good point. It's like, okay, wait a second. Do you want to do what you want to do for Jesus, or do you want to do what Jesus wants you to do? Because sometimes what Jesus, what God calls us to do, isn't what we want to do. But what's more important isn't that we just do what we think he wants us to do. We well, do what he actually wants well, us to do. Well, the point I'm trying to make is when we choose to do those other things, just like Andy said, just everything that he just brought out, when we choose to do those other things, we're turning, it could be a video game. Mm-hmm. It could be reading a book. It could be watching a TV oh, show. Yeah. Right. And look, I'm not villainizing any of that. You know, I, I watch TV shows, I read books, I play games, blah, blah, blah. But when we put that in front of or before, mm-hmm. now we've turned that, even if it's an activity, into an idol. Mm-hmm. And we, 
we've got to learn to not do that yeah. and put the true one in front of us right that gives you know that gives us the life we have yeah yeah i've i've definitely been guilty of that before is is you know you get up in the morning and say okay usually i'm at a certain time i'm going to have some prayer time or i'm going to uh, sit down and read some scripture and have a little bible bible study whatever the case may be and then okay something gets in the way you decide to do something else then later in the day something else gets in the way something else gets in the way and by the time it's time to go to bed at night you're tired and and uh, you're ready to go to bed. And I mean, how many of us? How many are else are guilty of of trying to pray at bedtime and falling asleep? <laughs> falling asleep. Yeah, yeah. And like yeah. waking up, going, okay, did I oh, yeah. say yeah. amen or not? Yeah, or right. God, so, what was our conversation yeah, like? Yeah. I don't remember. You know yeah. that. Uh, I mean, that's that's def- definitely an example of idolatry, and I'm definitely guilty of that. I think that uh, the the physicians nowadays would. I think they got a term for this ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sleep yeah. deprivation. Sleep yeah, something like that. Yeah, uh, I, you know my filter gets turned off. People sometimes I say things I don't mean, so I apologize. Anyway, going back to what we're saying, what are you willing to die for? You know, let's yeah. bring it back into that. Yeah, what and are you I, willing to die for? here's what I want to. I do have a scripture I would want just want to bring up. It's Second Corinthians chapter four, starting in verse seventeen. Um, before all this, Paul is <coughs> sort of talking about his struggles and suffering that he's going through for the sake of. The Corinthian church and verse 17 he says for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient or temporary but the things that are unseen are eternal they last forever so in all of it you know if and I want to speak specifically to like (laughs) and this I was just thinking about this yesterday the war in Israel like what's going on in Israel like COVID, all these things that happen that are just like, I mean, world shifting things, right? Um, I don't hear anything. I've not personally, you know, before it was like, it didn't matter where I went, Facebook, Instagram, you know, TikTok, wherever people go, you would see something about it. You know, I think I saw one IDF thing um, on YouTube the other day, you know, but now it's like, I'm not hearing anything at all. Um, And so here's the reality is the media will make us freak out wants us will wants to make us freak out about anything that it wants to make us freak out about do you they're, really want to get us started in a conversation <laughs> about mainstream media their goal their agenda is to get us to freak out about it and so people start writing books i don't i don't know how many i think i think it was probably 6 months after it was the first book i saw about covid that somebody wrote. We weren't even out of it yet. We weren't even on a full nationwide lockdown yet. And somebody had already written a book on how to operate your church Mm -hmm. in the midst of COVID. So what, what I'm, what I need all of us to understand is that from a biblical perspective, us as Christians, we've got to come at it from the biblical perspective, but at the same time, we can't allow ourselves to get, to idolize, get caught up in the lusts of the media of whatever it is, that they're trying to put out there because it is so easy for us as, as Christians to get caught up in that. However, there is an importance to it, like I said earlier. And so when we see what's going on over in the world, you know, and this is the question I'm going to bring up, what should our reaction be to Bible prophecy or when somebody comes out and says, hey, this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. You need to listen to me. Because the end is here. It's happening. This is, Jesus is coming back. Maybe they even say Jesus is coming back this year. How should we react as Christians to stuff like that? Because there's, there's an instance of like, okay, the government fails us. we got to stand up for the truth. Well, what about when Christians fail us? Because they're bringing not truths to us too because it's, they're so okay. determined about so these So i got things. something that's going to tie. Maybe, maybe we'll tie in there. I hope it does. Three things that you just sat there and said. Yeah. You open the door. So... Uh, Go for There's it. no apologies about what I'm about to say. Just here. say it. I'm fine. Um, with it. I have my opinion. Last time I checked, we still operate under the United States Constitution. I can say what I want. Okay. <laughs> a, the government has failed us. Yeah. That is a fact. All right. We are now at a an all time high in um, uh, what's the the eco- economic uh, inflations. We are paying more taxes than we ever have ever paid. The government is providing all these programs that do not work. The government has failed us. They've gotten way too big. Um, so that's my response to that. 
You don't need to look for the government to take care of you, if you will. Uh, the only thing that we need to look at to take care of us is our faith in God, our faith in Jesus Christ, and what he can do for us. Mm-hmm. And that's how I feel about that. Now, <clears throat> okay, so one of the things out of this book, so the definition of an apostate church, mm. definition of an apostate, no. so that I can get it right, I wanted to read it. No. There's one, a lot of those out there also. A, yeah, a absolutely. Lot of them. Oh, really? One yeah. who has abandoned one's religious faith, a political party, one's principles, or a cause. Mm. So are we living in a time where we have overall an apostate church? Yeah. And I think, I think the Bible says, I don't know the actual scripture, but I think the Bible actually says something about in the end times that you will see the apostate. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they're going to reveal themselves, and there's, yeah. going to be, there's going to be more of them that will make their presence known. You know, I think, and relating back to what Thomas was just saying a minute ago, how do we, how do we determine what we're going to follow, what we're going to believe, whether it be mainstream media, whether it be social media, or whether it be, uh, you know, someone of the Christian faith in the Christian church. And I think, you know, one thing you've really got to do is you got to pray for discernment every single day. You know, what you hear, you know, your diet, like I've seen people talking about, your diet is not only what you eat, it's what you but it's what you, what you take in also, whether it be uh, visually or, 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 you know, by ear or yeah. whatever the case may be. But we've got to pray for discernment. you got to ask God to say, let me please... Give me the wisdom to determine what of all of this is actually your truth. What is the truth? What is your truth out there? There is only, there is only, when it boils down to it, I don't care how many, you know, I've heard this before, you know, said, and it says, you know, usually in a domestic situation as we've responded to as cops, you know, yeah. there's uh, his story and there's her story and then <laughs> there's a the truth, middle, yeah. you know, which right. when it boils down to it, there is only the truth. That's it. That's all there is. To go back to what he was saying, though, all right, so it's the signs of an apostate church. I'm, I'm reading directly from the book that I just referenced a minute ago, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But number one, they have little or, no, little or no regard for the Bible. Number two, and there's a whole context after that. So, right. I mean, you need to read the book. Number two, they don't believe Jesus is the only door to the Father. Again, more context after that. Yeah, that's Oprah's church, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> number three, they have light regard for sin. And number and number four, they have light regard for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I say all that, and there's a lot of commentary after each one of those that I just sat there and read. But to me, everything that I read, we are living in a time where the church has gotten apostate. Now, I, I, I say that, and let me tie back to something else you did, because you opened the door about COVID, and I have my beliefs about COVID. COVID, to anyone that has lost somebody, and it was classified as a COVID death, I truly, truly feel for you. I don't want anyone to think that I'm, I'm, I'm cold to that or COVID is a real thing that came about. It's another form of the coronavirus. I understand that. Now, having said that, and I'm sorry for those that lost somebody and that I truly am. It's tragic. At the same time, in the healthy adults, in the average adult, COVID had a 99.7% survival rate. From everything that I've read, statistically speaking, okay, in... Elderly over 70, it dropped down to 94%. You just sat there and said, six months after the quote, and I'm doing my air quotes, people, <laughs> pandemic came out, there's a book coming out, How to Operate Your Church During COVID, right? Really? You mean to tell me they were able to write a book, uh, publish it, and get it on the shelves in six months after the pandemic started? Just like they were able to manufacture a another air quote vaccine, you know the normal process for vaccines is years, mm-hmm. not months, which tells me a few things. Personally, I think COVID was put in place to test responses. All right, I'm not saying COVID wasn't real. I'm saying COVID uh, might have been a tool. Yeah, yeah. Co- co- good, good way to put it. Yeah. Might have been a tool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, and you had churches that were shutting down, and this goes into what are you willing to stand for? Because I mean, I'm, I'm going to put you in, uh, in a in a scenario, Thomas. Let's say our pastor steps down, retires, whatever. You take over church. You're the you're the pastor of Gateway Church, and the government sits there and says, "Oh, we're in another pandemic. Oh my goodness, are you going to shut the doors of the church?" I'm putting no. you. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, we didn't. 
I mean, I was there for it in the midst of it for a little while, you know, when I came in as the associate pastor and that was never the option, you know. Okay, well, I'm going to go further. The World Health, whoever, whatever agency is out there saying, no, you got to do this, you got to do that, blah, blah, blah. There's all these mandates. You got to do this. Or, Thomas, if you don't shut your doors, we're going to put you in jail. Yeah, I mean, that's it just has to be that way. And there were people that were doing that. So you're telling me that you're going to sit there and risk going to going to prison over keeping the doors of the church open. Yeah, absolutely. Good. I'm hoping you're saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'll be standing right there with you. Yeah, because there's I mean, it's going to happen. We're going to be. We're going to be taxed. Nonprofit churches are going to be taxed eventually. I had a conversation with somebody actually that's that's in charge of a huge mega church. They're in the middle of COVID. I said, look, you've got to figure something out and stop running your church like a you know a business because nonprofits are going to be start being taxed. You know, you're running this like it's it's this huge thing that's on the radar of our government, and you're you're about to run into some serious issues if you if you continue like this and i you know i might have been speaking out of my butt because here we are you know 4 years later or 3 years later and that's not happened yet but i still believe that you know and so i think that in light of it all we need to recognize that we need to stand on the truth of you know the bible does say do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and that's the main thing so shutting the doors of your church means you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And it's that's not what we are called to do. As Christians, we're called to come together in community. Um, now, I, do I think it's going to be impossible for us to physically meet in a building all together someday? Absolutely. I think it was impossible at, at that point to do it in the Christian worldview during Jesus's time. That's why they met in houses, you know, but they had the synagogue where they were allowed to meet. So they would go, the Jews would go, the Gentiles couldn't necessarily but in, in the churches, in the house churches, they would go and they would, they would meet. And this is something that actually Ruth and I were talking about in the middle of COVID. We were like, how do we, how do we start house churches so that we can future-proof ourselves from this coming tyranny? You know, that we're, we're eventually not going to be able to operate inside of a church building, but we can still be the church. And that is something that, you know, we, we need, everybody should be thinking about, um, you know, well, COVID was definitely real. Yeah, Eric gave the survival rates, which were real. Also, COVID was real, but COVID was manufactured, and then it was exploited. One hundred percent, it was exploited for evil purposes. Yeah, right. It, it was. Yeah, there was nefarious intent behind it. Was, it was about control. About control. I mean, the World Health, World Health Organization. They have no jurisdiction over me. I can promise you that here in the United States or anybody else in the United States of America. Yeah. You know. or, the, or the, what is that other one? The National Institute of Health, Health Institute uh, of Health, and, NIH you know, or something like that. They don't you know, govern US. what I do. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and let me say this too, with everything that happened with COVID, I know we're talking about COVID when we're supposed to be well, biblical. Well, you worldview, got off on a side thing because it kind of opened a door. Yeah, for but, um, you know, this is why who you put in leadership as sheriff, as uh, law enforcement, period, is so important because when we were trying to meet and we were meeting during COVID, um, the sheriff, we had the sheriff's stamp of approval saying we will not come in there and make you guys shut your doors. Right. Well, I can tell you right now, Will Maddox would not have allowed that to happen. Yeah. And so I'm pretty sure Andy wouldn't have allowed that to happen in <laughs> Houston County. No. Know? And that was a huge deal to have that backing, but you have places in California and even Canada that like, I mean, there was a, I know a pastor. Canada. Specific, oh yeah, there it's a dumpster fire up there. Yeah. But so there's California. a pastor. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, there was a pastor that specifically um, did exactly what we're talking about, and he was imprisoned for a long time mm -hmm. in Canada. Where, where, yeah, in Canada. Yeah. 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 Um, and the wife actually, it's an incredible story. But the wife talks about how she had to deal with that with her kids and everything, mm -hmm. and he would not back down. Yeah. And that's very respectful. And that is that is the way we should hopefully be. We could all be. I, and I'll, let me say this. I hope I would do exactly what I said I would, I would do right here. Um, oh, I promise you, will, I want be to standing be. behind you, making <laughs> yeah. you do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, like, I want to be that person. However, we all have to understand we cannot be those people without the Holy Spirit. Exactly. We cannot do what it is God's called us to do. We can't stand in the midst of what's coming with the Bible prophecy, with all this stuff in the world. We cannot stand in the midst of any of it 
without the discernment. You cannot do it on your own. Number four, they have light regard for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. We're living in a time when the church has, you know, I'm on this new kick for this new word, maybe because I read it, whatever. (laughs) The church has become apostate. The church has become watered down. The church has become, okay, I went to church Sunday, so I'm good. Right? That we have to get back to the church being, well, not the church. I, I misused that. We have to get back to God, the Word, Jesus Christ being the guiding principle of everything that we do. And the way we do that is we do that through our church. Yeah. And if you we know. close the doors of our church, if we're not willing to stand on the principles that we talk about, which is what we're talking about today, folks. What are you willing to die for? There's many things that I'm willing to stand for. There's a lot of hills that I will, will, that'll be my last one, potentially. And I'm willing to do that because I believe that that is the truth. I believe that that is the way God wants us to be. We used COVID. You opened that door. I was hoping you would because I've been waiting (laughs) on that. We used COVID because that was, like you said, Andy, that was something that was manufactured. I think it was manufactured and put into place to test responses. I I don't think they got the response they wanted to get. But another one's coming. You know that. Another one is going to come. It's going to happen. Um, how are we going to respond at that point? Yeah. Well, you know, law enforcement officers and government officials and elected politicians uh, and even bureaucrats need to choose what hill they're going to stand on either, whether they're going to have the courage to stand or not. There are a lot of law enforcement officers around the country, none really in our area, but a lot of cops I was very, very disappointed in around the nation yeah. that were enforcing ordinances or mandates. codes or mandates that were unlawfully uh, passed by local governing bodies and, and state governors and state legislatures. Right. Uh, they, they were violating people's constitutional rights by enforcing these unconstitutional mandates, and see, laws, and, and ordinances. And that's the thing. I think they don't, the people don't know what their rights are. They don't know what the laws are. Mm-hmm. They don't, they you know, you you assume today. I think a lot of people my age, probably younger, they just assume if there's an authority figure mm-hmm. doing something, it's like, oh, they should know. They must know better than I do. Yeah. So I'm going to believe that. Well, I mean, cops cops have got to educate themselves, and they've got to look deep in their soul. I mean, you've got to really do some soul searching. Are you willing to lose your job to stand up for what is right? Yes, that's a t- that's a very that's a very tough question because you got you got people like, how am I going to feed my family? You know, I mean, if you're doing if you're doing it right, if you're a Christian, you're doing things for the right reason, and you're standing up for what is biblical, what is constitutional. I believe that you'll you'll be taken care of. But you know, are you willing to lose your job because you will not enforce an unlawful law or mandate? I think that that's your duty as a cop, as it a is. law enforcement officer. It's your duty to to deny those unlawful. Well, you swear an oath orders. to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution the, of your respective state. Absolutely, and, and the all filter the that I've seen. The filter that I've always sat there, and the guys that I've trained, and, and I'm, I'm training a kid, young kid right now. Um, the filter that I've sat there and said over and over is it: first, are your actions legal? Second, are your actions ethical and moral? And then third, does it? fall under the constant is it constitutional if you can answer the question yes to all those then you're doing the right thing if you are sitting there enforcing as a law enforcement officer if you enforce unlawful orders and i'm sorry a mandate to me i really need to back up i guess because not all mandates are going to be you know this covid mandates these covid restrictions all these things they were unlawful they were unconstitutional I mean, the numbers showed that. I mean, that, you're, 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 you're passing a law to stop the peaceful assembly, which is directly in violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. How do you pass a law against people peacefully assembling, especially, and, and this goes back to the First Amendment also, freedom of religion? How do you make someone wear a mask? Yeah, you did. They, I mean, really, I get it. <laughs> okay, we don't want to spread transmission of this. Yeah. Uh, then if that's the case, why weren't we doing and wearing masks for the last 40 years. The masks were worthless anyway. I mean, well, of course they were. But you had some places where cops were actually escorting people out and Mm -hmm. arresting them for disorderly conduct or other charges because they refused to put a mask on. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's an unlawful order. I can't make you wear a mask. I can't make you cover your face. You know, some people couldn't do that at all anyway. Right. You know, it's stuff like that. 
Yeah, you, you as a law enforcement officer, your duty is to in your first duty is, is to, to do what's right. Is to protect people's rights. Yes. You know, it's not always about writing somebody a ticket or putting somebody in jail. More of the time, uh, a, a law enforcement officer should make sure that people's constitutional rights are being protected. Whether, you know, you've got to watch yourself and your and your people that work with you to make sure they're not violating constitutional rights. But on top of that, and, and that's the way most cops look at things, is like, okay, we can't b- violate anybody's constitutional rights. Uh, you know, I can't let another law enforcement officer... Uh, violate someone's constitutional rights, but I don't think cops look at it from the perspective of, of I can't let this other person over here or this government body violate this individual's constitutional yeah. rights. Right, and I, I want to I want to come back to that because that's that's a really good statement you just made, and I think police officers and law enforcement really need to think about what we're talking about here because they are the ones that are going to st- that stand in the way that they they are the ones that. Um, s- that bridge the gap between what we are able to do and what we're not able to do well, as let, people. Let me give you a and, thought right there real quick. Yeah, go you, ahead. And I'll let you go on. As you see things progress, though, there will be laws that will be, and this is just my opinion, uh, you know, I think in, in the future there will be laws that will be passed that will be what I consider an unconstitutional law. Um, I believe that Andy would feel the same way that some of the laws that will be passed will be unconstitutional laws. And there will be officers that will, you know, they're going to task local police, local county, all this with enforcing that stuff. Yeah, because the federal government does not have the resources to enforce these laws no, across yeah. 330 million and population. And you will right, have right. local, state, law enforcement officers, I personally see it, that will walk away from the job. Okay, there'll so that's exactly that, what I There will be a handful that ask. will stay and that yeah. will do this stuff. But you will see, I dare say, a majority that I hope will so. walk away you know, and say, I'm not doing that yeah. because it's not right. That's right. right. Well, and, it, it all yeah. boils down to leadership. You you can have legislative bodies, whether it be a city commission or a, or a county commission, a state legislature, or the United States Congress pass unconstitutional laws, wrongful mandates, whatever you want to call them. But it all boils down to law enforcement leadership and what direction they're going to lead their troops in. Are, are you as a chief or a sheriff or a state highway patrol commander going to stand up and say to your people, this is wrong, we're we, are not enforcing, we are not enforcing this law? Go back several years. I'm going to use this. You know, we, we, we're kind of going down all these different avenues, and I like it. It's, it's good. Um, let's go down this avenue, and I'm going to put you on the spot, Andy, because you were actually there. Um, and I don't remember what year it was. You were the acting, or you were the uh, acting, you were the elected sheriff of Houston County at the time. You were, you were the sheriff. And there was a big push against the Second Amendment at that time. 2011. Was it 2011? Yeah, 2011. Hey, we're going to come in, we're going to take, you know, you don't need AR-15s, you don't need this, you don't need that. And, it, and let me un- get the understanding out there of how I feel about the Second Amendment. To me, the Second Amendment is probably more important than the first because without the Second Amendment, you cannot defend any of the others, okay? The others exist because of the Second Amendment. Yeah. Now, again... Second I'm, Amendment stops tyranny. Yeah, absolutely. Shit. I'm not sitting there saying that we take up a bunch of, you know, no. arms and we go aside. That, that's not what I'm saying. I don't agree with that. That's just, that's a just in case, uh, an emergency break glass. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> if you read the Constitution, that's what it's written for. Mm-hmm. Um, ha- having said that, personally, I think if you are a law-abiding, legal... Uh, citizen of the United States, where we have that constitution in place. If I want to own a freaking, you know, F fifteen fighter jet, if I got the money, okay, you know, that's a little bit extreme. But so anyway, we go back to twenty eleven, and th- they've got this big push against the quote assault weapons, um, and you know, we could get into a conversation about that down the road. I can assault you with a rock, but um. <laughs> We get into this big push with, you know, we're going to take the assault weapons, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And Andy sat there and said, in Houston County, we will not enforce any unlawful laws that are passed. I don't remember how you put it, but it was basically saying, no, we're not going to do that here. Yeah, Yeah, I I was, there were were a lot of sheriffs, but uh, I was one of the first ones that signed uh, signed a petition or signed you know, something that the Sheriff's Association had sent out uh, to 
to, to back down. It was Obama at the time yeah. to back down the Obama administration and some of their unconstitutional gun laws. And, and you know, they were trying to, trying to mandate that you know, sheriffs and police chiefs were to enforce these federal laws and uh, just said, no, nah, we're not going to do it. So let me ask you this. Uh, fast forward now. That was back in 2011. Fast yeah. forward to, to now. We're about to hit 24. Yeah. How do you think people would stand now? And when I say people, how do you think uh, law enforcement administrators and leaders would stand now? I think they should be even more adamant than we were in 2011. <laughs> oh, I get that. I, I understand yeah. it. But how do you do you think it's watered down enough now that you got some people that would back down? I think I think you got a lot of chiefs. So I, the thing about the thing about the office of the sheriff, and I'm not going to say that they're not sheriffs that have bowed down to the cabal, if you want to say, or the, the whole ideology, <laughs> I like that term. the whole ideology, or, or big government, the federal government. There, there are some sheriffs that have went along with some of those mandates and unconstitutional laws. I'm not saying there's not, but generally 99.9% per, of your sheriffs are elected officials and they are held accountable only to the people. Yeah. You know, you've got a, you've got a few places that have an appointed sheriff. Actually, uh, Dade County, Miami, uh, just, they, they went to an appointed sheriff, uh, back in the seventies, I believe about 75, I think. And this year, they're going back to an elected sheriff for, for Dade, Dade County. And I think that there's 14 individuals running for the office of sheriff down there now. But a sheriff in particular is someone who is going to stand up for uh, people's individual freedoms. Chiefs can be fired by a, uh, a city commission. Uh, they could have a you know majority vote with a city commission and, and put a chief out of office. But you can't do that with a sheriff unless there's some type of wrongdoing and the governor removes them or... The people vote them out. Which goes back to the way the country should be being run. It should be yeah. run by the people. Yeah. Understand. And the, the sheriffs, sheriffs across the nation should be standing up for what's right, what's constitutional. They should be standing up for their constituents. And, and all. that's where I want to stand on what yeah. I'm saying. I'm, look, it, I almost feel like I'm being anti-government myself. I'm not being anti-government. I, I'm anti-big love this, government. I, I love this country. This country pro is... Pro-limited government. I, I'm, I'm pro-limited government the way that our our founding fathers designed our country to be. Yeah. Uh, America's weak, weak the, central government, stronger yeah. local government. And, you know, the states are supposed to govern themselves. Uh, I'm not anti-American. I love this country. I'm American blue-blooded through and through, and, and I'm patriotic for our country. I'm not anti-government. I believe that our system of government is probably still the best system in the world. Right. I do believe that we've given too much power to it, and the government has gotten a little bit too big. Now, having said that, you know, I asked you the question, when we fast forward to 24, how many police or law enforcement or you know, sheriffs would back down from where that stance was before? I think you answered that. Um, but going back to what we talked about, the position that you had as sheriff, let's look at it for what it is. The position that a police chief has, you're leading these guys. You are that official. You've got to stand on, you know, on, on the word as well, I believe. And you got to do what's right. You have to, you have to be willing in that position, all the way up to losing your position as police chief or exactly. as director of public safety for the state or as. And, the, and he's right. The only way you're really going to get kicked out of sheriff is, a sheriff is if you do something illegal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know that's um, on, that's the only way you're going to be removed from office without a vote of the of the, your constituents. Or, mm-hmm. You know, right. and, and Eric, you know what you're getting to is what you know. The leadership, the chiefs, the sheriffs are the ones who are going to put forth what, what policy. I mean, mm-hmm. what you're going what you're going to do. I mean, first career is one of the things I use a lot in the leadership presentations. And I, you know, I tell law enforcement leaders, you've got to be vocal. I don't care if you're a leader of the New York Police Department. You cannot push policy to your assistant chiefs, commanders, even down to the lieutenant level. You cannot put that policy out to them and expect your wishes or your viewpoint or your philosophy on law enforcement to trickle down to all of the law enforcement officers. <laughs> yeah. You've got to put that out. They've got to hear that yeah. from you. And uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 8 says, for if the trumpet gave an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? And you've got to, you've got to have a philosophy and you've got to stand upon that. You can't have a chief say in one thing or a sheriff, either one, you can't have a chief or a sheriff or a state patrol commander saying one thing and then his subordinates saying something different. Your personnel have got to know what your philosophy is and they've got to hear it come out of your mouth. What do you want to accomplish? Uh, what are your goals? What are your objectives? What are your viewpoints? 
you got to be the trumpet. Where, where do you stand on the Constitution? And yeah. yet that trumpet cannot give an uncertain sound. It's got to be one voice. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, that's absolutely. What, that's what law enforcement leadership needs right. to be doing. And so what we're talking about is law enforcement in light of all these things that are coming down, that are coming down the uh, pipe, right? So like Bible prophecy. So if all these things are happening, there's going to be a one world order. There's going to be our government um, is is eventually and and um, I'll say going to put things past things that we're not going to agree with that infringe on our rights. So we're saying, okay, well, what what are the police going to do, right? So now what we we've kind of answered that. Like maybe this is what well, best case scenario. This is what the police will do. This is what sheriffs will do. If not, this this and this and this will happen. Um, but now we, we need to sort of answer the question is how should we respond to this as if, if you're not a police officer, if you're not in a position of authority in that way, how do you respond to that as a Christian? And, and this is the way hopefully sheriffs and police that are Christians will respond. Um, I'm going to read scripture. I'm just going to read um, Matthew 24. This is Jesus responding to um, the Pharisees that are, uh, I'm sorry, the disciples that are just asking Jesus, hey, when are these things going to happen? When are the end time, these end times you're talking about? This coming up at the end of the age, what's, when's that going to take place? And this is what Jesus says to them. He says, see that no one leads you astray. Okay, so the first thing is, how do we respond? We make sure that we have discernment. Right. We don't let people lead us astray. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, how do we do that? We read what's true. Okay, you don't go around in order. So if someone brings a counterfeit, or if you're trying to see what, money is counterfeit. You're not, you don't, the best way to figure that out isn't to go study the counterfeit money. The best way to figure that out is to study what the money actually looks like, what the true money should actually look like. You look at that, you study it, you know it, and then you come. And then if anybody brings anything wrong, counterfeit to you, you're going to know it's, it's not legit. That's the way the secret service teaches their agents to recognize counterfeit bills. Look at that. I might as well be a law enforcement officer. I mean, (laughs) you, you, you said it perfectly. I mean, that's, that's the way the secret service teaches their personnel. Right. And that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Don't be led astray. Don't let any of this stuff, you know, lead you down a path that you don't need to go down. Know what's real. Then you'll know what's counterfeit. There you go. And the devil, the devil always counterfeits. Yes. What? God puts forth. Oh my gosh. He, tra- yeah. he tries to counterfeit it to make it look real yes. when it's not. And that's where that discernment comes from. And that leads you right back to what apostasy actually is. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the main thing is recognizing the real deal when it's there. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you don't have a relationship with the truth, you don't read your Bible, you're not gonna know. No. You're gonna you're gonna be listening for something, listening for a trumpet, listening for anything <laughs> that you, you don't even know where you're going. No. You, you don't know what to be looking for. So that's the first thing is we can't be led astray, which means we need to gird up the loins of our mind, focus on what is actually true. Um, And then he goes on to say, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So again, that goes with that. Don't be led astray. When the counterfeit comes to you, know what the real deal is. Um, And then verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. So the second thing is, don't be alarmed. <laughs> don't be surprised. Don't be shocked and don't get discombobulated when don't be scared. Yeah, don't be scared when these things start to happen because Jesus said they're going to happen. And not only are they going to happen, he says they must, they have to happen. Mm-hmm. Before. Before. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So um these things have to take place. And when these things take place, he says, the end is not yet. So if you're alarmed at the outset, <laughs> right. you're not going to make it to the end. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. you know as, as Christians, of course, it, it's, it's not easy to not be scared yeah. or afraid or alarmed about the circumstances that are going on in the world right now yeah. and, and how these events are leading to the end times. Yeah. But as Christians, there should also be an air of excitement yeah. about these things yes. happening because... As Christians, we know that it is coming more right. to the end, end times. And then as Christians, we should really be ramping up our game even more yeah. the closer we get to the end times yeah. uh, and proclaiming Jesus Christ and spreading the gospel and, and being very vocal about it. It just goes back to what I was talking about about the college football a while ago. Are you as excited about what's right and wrong or what's godly and what's ungodly and what's uh, satanic, non-satanic, or evil and good uh, as you are about college football? Yeah, as a Christian, and you should be even more so if you think the end times are near. Absolutely, and and not just excited, but 
um, motivated. also motivated and, and, and recognizing this is an opportunity. More and more people are see, could see the Bible unfold that never understood the Bible, never saw Jesus, whatever it is. You have an, we have an opportunity to use these things and say, look, you see that? That's God doing something in this yeah. world. There, yeah, hey, spoiler alert, we win. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean. Well, there, there is no other book that I'm aware of that tells you about history and also predicts the future That's in, right. the, in the same book. That's right. Okay, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's, there's no other book. Yeah. Yeah. Not even, uh, there's no other religion that makes prophecy the way the Bible does. No. Um, and the people will, will think there is because there must be, but especially, there's not. <laughs> especially prophecy that comes true. That comes true. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely not. There, um, there's no other book that has ever prophesied anything that yeah. has actually come true. Absolutely. Now there are books that have made prophecies in a way, mm-hmm. but they're not. They've not come true. <laughs> right. And and that's the main thing. And so, that's that's it, right? Okay. So there's that. Okay. So first, don't be led astray. Second, don't be alarmed. Okay. So then it says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. So that's the beginning. Right again. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away. Okay, so here's the third thing: we don't fall away. Right. Okay, so don't be alarmed, don't be led astray, and then don't fall away. Stand tall. Stand tall. Yeah. Don't be the one that that um, you know, kind of like how Peter did, right? <laughs> and and not that we're saying we're better than Peter, but. You know, Jesus told him, look, when the before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. Okay, things are going to be bad, and you're going to deny me. And he says, no, no, there's no way. Not at all. I, I won't be that person. You've told me. He straight up told Peter, and Peter still did it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for us to sit here and be like, ah, we're not going to do that. You know, I know what the Bible says and stuff. You, you've, that's why it's so important. Like I said, again, I can't emphasize this enough. To be led by the Holy Spirit, no, not about to say the same thing. Not be led by your will, your that. emotions, your instinct, your own passions. That it doesn't work. Yeah, it's you're not going to be able to do that on your own strength. No, it's got to be God. So, in order to not fall away, we've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness, okay, will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Endures in what? In love. Right. Exactly. You know, I think uh, before the end times come, whether it's two years from now or five years or 20 years from now, I think our nation and, and our world, but Christians need to realize uh, there's going to be some hard times. There's going to be some tough times. And uh, all of that stuff out there, that new truck and that, that, uh, that, new house and that great job and everything, all those things are going to fall to the wayside because none of those are, are really going to matter at that point. <coughs> uh, I, I really don't, I don't believe that Christians will be here for the tribulation. I believe the church will be taken before the tribulation actually comes, but there are going to be some really tough times p- prior to the tribulation also, especially for Christians. And uh, we need, need to make sure we always stand up for our faith. I mean, because it's just like... Uh, so the Bible says, you know, if you deny me, I'm going to deny you before my yeah. father. And here's the deal. Like what you said is all throughout church history, that's been the norm to mm-hmm. suffer right. for Jesus, like, right. to suffer, to be persecuted, to be, you know, the, pri- the prize is not now. The prize is eternal. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. So for us to expect that we're going to escape any suffering in the name of Jesus is, I think, wishful thinking. Um, you know, it's clear that as Christians, if we're going to truly live according to Jesus, the, the way of Jesus, you know, to follow his path and to do what it is he's told us to do, um, we're going to suffer if and we're going to see things we don't want to see. That's not even wishful thinking. That's delusional. Yeah, it's yeah. delusional. It's, Absolutely. You're, it's not the way that it's going to be. Right. You're right, Andy. There's going to be a lot more suffering that comes up, again, in my opinion. And if you read what we do, it, it has to. You know, when when certain things take place and the Antichrist does take over, You know, if you're left behind, whatever, you know, however you look at that, you look at it the way the Bible says it, you know, you're not going to be able to buy, sell anything without the mark. You know, what kind of suffering is going to take place at, you know, at that time? You're not going to be able to feed your family, you know, do certain things. 
I said, I don't think Christians are not going to worry about that. I, not everybody who sits there and says, hey, I'm Christian is going to be there, though. Right. Oh, that's true. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's, definitely true. Mm-hmm. It's just because I sit there and say, yeah, I, I prayed the prayer. I, I'm a Christian. I go to church. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to, you know, where's your heart? You know, that's it comes down to, and that's something I was thinking about no. today. You can't, you can't only be, you cannot only be, uh, be a believer. You got to be a follower also. Yeah. You know, like I said, you know, uh, I heard a comment about atheism one time. It said, hey, even the devil wasn't stupid enough to fall for that. Uh-huh. You know, he believes in God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the demons, they yeah. all yeah. believe, in, they believe in God, you know? but they don't follow him. So yeah. you can not only be a believer, but you've got to be a follower. Not to say we'll be sinless. Yeah. You're still going to, you're but still going to sin, but you've got to be, you got to be repentant and you've got to follow those those principles that are set forth and it comes in, to a in relationship the Bible. too. Yeah, you got to have, have a personal relationship. relationship. You have to have that. And I was thinking about that today because I haven't. You know, there are times in my life, my prayer life is a lot stronger, and then there are times like I'm going through one right now. Mm-hmm. Just like you said earlier, you know, right. hey, man, I get busy doing this. You know, I need to take time to do that. But now I got to go do this, and you know, I'm trying to have that prayer time. Uh, you know, as I'm falling asleep, right? You know, yeah. we talked yeah. about. Yeah, but it comes down to. The, the thing that kept popping in my head this morning, and guys, I'm sorry, I, I sound nasally right now. I'm battling sinus problem. Uh, I can hear it. <laughs> oh, that was great. That was yeah, great. That, that's all in the Hey, Thomas, do not, do not edit that. Yeah, we <laughs> need that in there. I want yeah, people to understand that. that. I don't care. Y'all, I, I got sinus problems. I the don't sound care. of snot. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. But no, it comes down to and what I was thinking about was you don't have, I didn't have that, not all the time am I praying as much as I should. You know, and... We should pray without ceasing, you know. We've heard that many times. How do you do that? That It's hard to do. The verse that came to me this morning was, depart from me, I never knew you. Mm, yeah. Which means that there has to be a relationship there. I have to have that relationship. If I don't have that relationship, the only way you have that relationship is through, you know, through your prayer life. Mm-hmm. You know, God's got to hear you. Mm-hmm. Not just you going to God, going, you know, hey man, God, can you do this, can you do this for me? Yeah, you know, God, I really need this. Will you, I'm praying for that. You know, heal this, give me that. Blah blah blah. Yeah, you got to have a relationship. And a lot of times that is, man, I'm just talking to you, God. Yeah, I used yeah. to have conversations with my dad, and a lot of times it would be, you know, hey, I hadn't talked to you in a little while. You know, what's mm-hmm. going on? This and that. But I got so much out of that. Yeah, and that's what you got to do with God. Absolutely. And and John, Jesus says. To know God is eternal life. So, you know, a lot of people think that it's just, oh, I just got to believe that God exists and I'm saved. (laughs) It's like, no, that's not it at all. You know, it's so much more than that. (laughs) To know God is eternal life. And so to know somebody, you've got to spend time with them. You've got to know, you've got to want to know them. You've got to want to uh, have a relationship with them. You know, I could be married to my wife, but never spend time with her. Is that really marriage? No, probably not at all. She's not going to stay married to me very long, you know. Um, but if I if I marry her, I'm going to spend as much time with her as I possibly can so I can know her because um, that's the part of marriage. That's what it is. It's to be married is to know my wife. And so, um, you know, that's where it all boils down to is do you know God? But, yeah, I think that's all really good stuff in light of how we should react to biblical prophecy being fulfilled. And, and like we started off talking about, when we see these things, you know, first off, we can't get caught up in it. We can't let the media dictate our belief about it. We can't, and when I say media, I don't just mean mainstream media because there are other people that are also trying to lead us astray and are caught up in it that you could watch on YouTube. You can, you can listen to their podcasts, you, whatever it is. We can't let media dictate our beliefs about things or our um, our emotions about things because there are a lot of people that get bent out of shape and, and get alarmed at what's going on and in order to keep a level head we've got to think for ourselves we've got to pray and read the Bible for ourselves yeah. and, and as, as, as men you owe that to your family also absolutely not not only your your immediate family but your extended family and your your friends and and the ones who you know there's a lot of people that that look up to certain people you know and and uh, a good man is often looked up to by uh, numerous individuals not just his family so uh, we we owe that to other people to remain calm and to 
using our discernment and our, our prayer life and, and reading the Bible and knowing what is actually right. And we need to make sure that we profess that mm-hmm. openly also. Yes. And, and that brings me up to a really good point, which is there's this man, Rick Burgess. I know everybody mm-hmm. probably oh, around yeah. here knows who that is. Yeah. Um, he started the man church and he has this really great teaching that he does um, with the man church. The first opening, the opening night that you do it, you'll see a video of him and he talks about, um, that is powerful. How there are only men that the only thing they have to offer their families in time of desperation is a sports game uh-huh. or knowledge about the deer that they went out to go hunt, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever, or, you know, that's all they have to offer them. And he says, but if you could sit there and actually, you know, or they're looking, uh, he talks about his son that, that drowned uh, in a pool, this two year old son. And while they're standing in the hospital, you know, he didn't have the option to say, you know, Hey, where's the pastor? Let me go get the pastor or let me, let me find somebody that can speak into this situation. It was him. His wife didn't want anybody. She didn't want the pastor. She didn't want anybody. She wanted him, her husband to be there. And he had to have something to offer in that moment of solace, of, of safety, of, of encouragement, of, of any kind of hope beyond what it is that happened right there. And most men, especially if you don't have Christ, all they have to offer is their job or, you know, their, their hobby, whatever, fishing, whatever that thing is. Yeah. If it's your life, that's the only thing you have to offer people. But if God is your life, because Rick was a Christian and he was devoted to that, he had something more. He could actually provide something for his family and say, you know what, let's pray, let's read. You know, I got the scripture, I've got this thing. We're going to make it through this. This is hard but God's, God's in it, you know, and he uses that platform today to share that. And that's so important. Like you said, Andy, for men to be able to have that for their families, don't just go through the motions throughout life. Don't just (coughs) let things dictate your emotions. Don't let others dictate your thoughts, but, but know what the Bible says so that you can be the one that can stand in the gap for your family, that can stand in the gap for whatever situation is going on. You'll have something to offer. God will have something to offer through you. Right. You know, uh, in life, but mostly during my law enforcement career, and as, as much death and as destruction as I've seen over a 30-year career, I've always wondered how do people that do not have faith in God deal with death? I just, I, I just have no idea how they can deal with death if they have no hope whatsoever. And it's just really always been one of those things that just lingered upon my mind. Like, how, how, do the, how do these people deal with, with death with no hope? You know? and, and going back to what you were saying about a man needing to be the one to, to be strong for their family or their, their friends or their, their coworkers or whoever in a, in a time of trial or trouble. You know, there's a saying that says, always uh, look for the calmest guy in the room. You know, to it. <laughs> yeah. look for the calmest guy in the room. That's the one that you want to follow. That's it. And every every man, especially Christian men, need to be that calmest guy in the room, the one that other people can look for for strength, the ones that other people can look for for direction, the ones that other people can look for 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 hope and safety. You know, something came up just just now hit me, and you asked the question: How can people? Because we have, we've seen a lot of death. We've seen a lot of tragedy. Um, a lot of things, you know, we, we've seen the worst side of, of people in what they can do to each other. Okay, so we've seen that. How do you, how do you exist without having that, that belief? You know, how do you get through a lot of that? And a lot of people don't without having that belief. But it, that reminds me of somebody that, it, it's a guy that Andy and I worked with. Um, and I'm not going to say his name. But he, he went through this illness, and he actually died. He, he literally, and, and I want to say he was, he was gone for anywhere from four to six minutes. I can't remember. Fast forward to they brought him back, and he literally sat there and told me, was it, God's not real. There's nothing. He said, I died. He said, it was nothing but black. It was, you, you just, it's, it's over. There was a reason for that. And I, I said, the, the hmm. only thing that would pop into my head at that point was, how can that not motivate you? <laughs> you literally are telling me that the only thing you experienced after you died, you clinically died, they said he's gone, was darkness and black. And you're telling me that doesn't scare 
the absolute, pardon my language, hell out of you. I don't understand how people can have that thought process. I really don't. You know, but that, that's, and that may not even be pertinent to what we're talking about, but it goes into what you said. How do you, how do you believe that? How do you believe that there's nothing out there? Right. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think all throughout history, people have come up with their ways of dealing with that, you know, but I think what you said earlier is there are a lot of people that just don't, they don't deal with it. They don't figure that kind of stuff out. They don't, they don't care to think about it. Instead, they have other things that they want to think about or the pleasures that they want to dive into, you know, um, or they're just not, and you know, the Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses and sin, right? We're, we're completely, a, a corpse is completely cut off from life. You know, there's no un- understanding at all of life. So in order for a, a corpse to think about being alive, it has to experience life first. And, and that's the thing. I think a lot of people that are thinking about the things of God, um, those are the ones that are experiencing life, even if it's just on their own little minuscule part of it. You know, now, do they ever go into fullness of life? I don't know. You know, that's, that's different. But there are those that I think are completely dead, like we're completely dead. We have no awareness, no ability to think about God or want to even, you know. Um, and so I think that those people that, that don't have Christ, don't have God and have to go through those things in life. I mean, it's just a dead body traveling throughout, throughout you know. Time and space. Yeah. I mean, yeah, on a rock yeah. floating through space. That's yeah. their life. And it's sad. It's very sad, you know, but um, that's why it's so important for us to have conversations and, yeah. and present life to them, present mm-hmm. that light and say, look, there's an opportunity for you to come alive. There's someone that died for you so that you could live. I, I think people like that, you could sit there and talk to them all day long. They're not going to understand that until they have an experience. No, yeah. right. But the seeds in right. Grace is God's divine influence. Yeah? yeah. So over time, as things are planted in our life, one day, the hope is that one day that person turns around and sees this train of influence. Yeah, yeah. don't get me wrong. I'm not you saying know. we should not. Yeah, you know, right. That's but it is hard, hard though. But I think like what you're saying, that's I think hard. people like yeah. that, I think it takes, okay, you know, the seeds are planted, mm-hmm. but I think it takes those experiences that take them to the brink of, you know, however you want to put it, for God to get a hold of them. Yeah. It, I mean, it did that for me. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I told you before, I was saved at 16, but I fell away. And I fell away. And, and at one point, I would have even sat there and said, you know what, I don't buy into this anymore. But uh, it took... Mm-hmm. One day I'll sit there and talk about it on, on here. <laughs> All right, But it, it took a very, very uh, catastrophic event, I, I guess you'd call it, to, to kind of put me back on the road. And I was in that place where it, that's what it took. You know, I mean, he had to slap me in the face. God hits hard. Okay, he does. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, guys, you know, I hate to, I hate to cut us off because we can talk all day. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I can talk good. all day. <laughs> we, can get, we can go from topic to topic to topic, to topic, to topic and everything. But I think we've been going long enough that we don't want to. We don't want to talk past people's attention span because they may shut us off and then they may not hear something that may be relevant to them or yeah. something that may touch them. And our, our whole thing with this podcast is that, you know, all the glory be given to God and that, uh, you know, if we did a thousand episodes and only one person was touched by something that was included on this podcast and out of a thousand episodes, then, then We've Vision done. We've done what we're supposed yeah, to do, yeah, you know. And uh, we we followed that calling, and 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 like I've said before, that that quote that I have said before is, that, you know, we're not called to be successful; we're called to be faithful. Yeah. And as long as you're faithful, there will be success. And we we may not ever see that, but that's something that that uh, sometimes God will only know. But if that only one person is ever touched, and we've done what we're supposed to do, but I think we're we've run we've run the course for, <laughs> we've run the course for the day for sure. And um, so we me... appreciate we appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to this, uh, please check out our Facebook page, The Shepherd Station on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to us on Spotify or Apple or some of the other... What's some of the other ones we're on? Platforms. You, you put us on Spotify and Apple? What's, yeah, what's, there's... I mean, anywhere you can pretty much get get the, get a podcast. We're yeah, on just, that. You know, Google, um, Google it. You know, yeah, just... It'll, yeah, it'll, it'll pop it. up some of the, the Shepherd Station. Again, comment too, man. Yep. Let us know what you want us to talk about. Um, 
Uh, let us, give us, let a us yeah. Let, let us, us know, know if this stuff is is actually relevant, or maybe if it's helped you, or or, or if there's know. anything you want us to talk about that you think <laughs> pertains to law enforcement, police being a man, yeah. you know, leader, leadership in today's culture, whatever that thing. Might well, be. I'll, I'll tell you something else. I mean, this podcast it not only touches people that are listening to it, but I mean, it it touches us also, and that we we learn a lot of different things by sitting here and talking about some of these subject these oh, top, yeah. these topic areas also that that uh, hopefully will apply to us and make us better men also. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's definitely a goal too. So, mm-hmm. but, right. uh, well, I'm going to wrap us up then if that's okay with y'all. All right. Yeah. So, again, we talked about the prophecy, you know, that we're living in today. Uh, we talked about what, you know, hills you're, you're willing to stand on. Understand this. You must take up your cross and follow Jesus. You carry it or you won't reach heaven. Jesus said that, and that is a direct quote out of the book from uh, Jonathan Shuttlesworth. I really recommend that book. Like I said, he's not contacted me. I haven't talked to him, but the book is outstanding. Uh, take up your cross. Do what you're supposed to do, man. Learn what you're going to stand on and stand on it. Be be that 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 light for people. That's what we want to do. We want to uh, we want to thank you for listening. Hope we've empowered some of you today. Hope we've inspired some of you today. We're coming at you again from the Stockyard, 24 East Church Street in Headland, Alabama. Come see us. Uh, Thomas, you started us off. You know what? I'm going to do this today. Let's close out in prayer. There you go. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity for uh, to 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 use this as a platform to further your kingdom. We love you with all our heart. We pray that people can hear, you know, what you have put out and, and inspire them to to be the men, be the people, be the be the women that they need to be. And we pray that your your words don't fall on deaf ears. Uh, we love you with all our heart. Go with us today as we can further your kingdom and your will be done above all other things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.